My topic is talking about the iron deficiency, uh, uh, in general, just a simple approach and how we can differentiate it with other uh, diseases with microcystic hypochromic anemias. And um, um, I guess today uh, it was required for me to talk about many investigation diagnoses, but if you had the time, you can talk about the treatment as well. So today I'm going to talk about introduction to the iron deficiency anemia. Uh, uh, how it can present, uh, what available tests that are present to, uh, available worldwide and those that are present in Kuwait, what is the etiology of iron deficiency anemia in general, how do you approach it in terms of etiology, diagnosis, treatment, uh, in terms of oral versus parental uh, oral preparation, and some points to remember at the end. So you know anemia is occupies uh, about one quarter of the um, uh, diseases worldwide and half of it is as a re result of iron deficiency anemia. So it is most prevalent among preschool children and you can see it mostly in uh, women, uh, especially uh, among women at uh, the pre-menopausal uh, uh, phase and those who are having increased requirements during pregnancies and lactation and so it, uh, uh, pregnancy and lactation. So successful management of iron deficiency anemia is not only identifying it as a disease, but it is very important to identify the underlying cause of iron deficiency anemia. So if we going to define anemia in terms of the World uh, Health Organization definition of anemia. So what is the definition of anemia in children from six months to five years? It is defined as a hemoglobin level less than 11 gram per deciliter. Those children between 5 to 11 years, so uh, any hemoglobin level between uh, less than 11.5 is considered as anemia. And in children 12 to 14 years, a hemoglobin level less than 12, so we can see here they almost approach adult values. And non pregnant women uh, would say less than 12. And in pregnant women, less than 11, so the uh, value becomes lower. And in men, of course, less than 13. And we can uh, categorize uh, the anemia according to the degrees of deficiencies to mild, moderate, and severe. So almost any, anything below 8 is considered as severe anemia. So how these patients present usually? The most common presentation that we encounter in our clinics, especially we're talking of severe anemia. They come with uh, exogenous palpitations, generalized fatigability, um, uh, short breath, especially uh, upon uh, exertion. But don't forget that we have those entities that are iron deficient, but they did not reach the stage of iron deficiency anemia. Do these patients present to symptoms? Yes, they do. They can present of, uh, of uh, symptoms of fatigue, uh, hair loss mostly, maybe some of neurocognitive disturbances. They would tell you that I feel less concentrated, I have less mood. Then some of them would um, have that thermal dysregulation, so they feel coldness even at the uh, warm uh, place. And other uh, more severe uh, man manifestations, for example, having like heart failure, um, uh, cardiac instability, and angina pectoris. Uh, of course, dizziness is very common uh, presentation in this patient, and headache. Don't forget headache, uh, of course. Excuse me? Yes. We talk about those uh, patients who has low iron but uh, did not reach the level of the uh, Yes. You mean we, the ones that we recognize them by having low ferritin? Low ferritin, exactly. So these patients, mostly they have the hair loss, fatigability, uh, neurocognitive disturbances, these are the most common symptoms that we encounter. But this is not so common because if you have the dizziness, you should have the reach an anemia stage to have the dizziness. So the available tests that are uh, present, serum iron. Serum iron, uh, it is measured in serum, and, uh, preferably, and in plasma. And uh, it usually uh, measures the circulating iron. It uh, and uh, which is uh, most of it is bound to, to a uh, protein, transferrin. And it is uh, low in um, uh, states of iron deficiency anemia and also in anemia of Crohn's disease. So you can see uh, serum iron is not very accurate indication itself of iron deficiency anemia. 
Remember that the uh, serum iron also can affected by whatever diet the patient is taking. For example, if the night before patient had a meal which is rich in iron, the next day it would be high. If he didn't have a uh, meal rich in iron, next day it would be low. Even the, uh, the uh, time of the day it is taken. So if it's taken early in the morning, it is much higher than one, the one taken uh, later in the afternoon. So if we're going to interpret the serum iron, it should be in a view of other investigation and other iron profile, not only serum uh, iron. The other test that we order is the transfer. So what is the transfer? It is the vehicle for the iron to be transported across the body. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, uh, in iron deficiency anemia, it is increased, but anemia of Crohn's disease, it is decreased. So this is a way we can differentiate between anemia of Crohn's disease and iron deficiency anemia. And it, it, is, uh, it, it can be reported as total iron uh, binding capacity. So the, both of these are uh, also surrogates. So both of, the, of them would be increased in total iron binding capacity uh, in iron deficiency anemia. So the way to uh, calculate total iron binding capacity is to multiply transfer concentration by 1.389. Transfer saturation. Saturation, uh, it is a ratio of the serum iron and total iron binding capacity. So we see in iron deficiency anemia, we have less of the iron and increased total iron binding capacity. That's why you have see a, a high transfer in saturation in iron deficiency anemia. So a cutoff point, usually we take it as iron deficiency anemia, less than 16% is cutoff point to indicate iron deficiency anemia. Serum ferritin. Usually what we like in how our hospital and uh, we depend mostly upon to diagnose iron deficiency anemia is ferritin. Because ferritin is a storage uh, form of iron. Some of it is in the bone marrow and some of it is the circulating form. So we what we measure is circulating form. So it, is, uh, it has a sensitivity of 90% uh, specificity of 85%. But remember that serum, though it is very specific and sensitive, but it can affect it as an acute phase reactant. For example, if we have a patient that uh, having acute inflammation or infection, for example, a patient with diabetic foot, or a patient having like a malignancy, or uh, acute infection, so it will be falsely elevated at that time. Falsely elevated. Elevated. So if you Rheumatoid arthritis, exactly. So all of these are anemia of chronic infection. Even patient uh, post bariatric surgery, especially uh, uh, sleeve or bypass, so they have like a chronic inflammatory state. That's why our cutoff point of diagnosis, our deficiency anemia of this patient is higher. So if we have a very low level, for example, uh, 13 less than 50, less than 20% cutoff point, for example, and uh, and in some other references, they were still like, uh, less than 30%. This is diagnosis of iron deficiency. How much the usually 100 or 80? In the regular state, it is less than 20. And some references, let's say, less than 30. But I would say less than 20 is our cutoff point. But in anemia of chronic inflammation, less than 60 is considered as iron deficiency anemia. Okay, uh, the previous test that I mentioned, the, all of them are uh, available here in Kuwait. But those that are uh, available, but not in every uh, labs, but here in Kuwait, these are not available. The soluble transferring receptor. So it is a protein, it is uh, the uh, result of um, uh, cleavage uh, of the membrane transferring. And when we have a state of increased erythropoiesis, for example, in artificial anemia, the bone marrow trying to compensate. So we have an uh, increase in the solute transparent uh, uh, receptors. Okay? And also, it is, uh, an, it is rever uh, reversibly related also to the serum iron. So the lower the serum iron, the higher would be the soluble transferring receptors. So it is a way mostly, uh, it is used to differentiate between anemia of chronic inflammation and uh, anemia, uh, iron deficiency anemia. Because as you know, in, uh, in iron deficiency anemia, you have more of the transferring. 
So, we, as we said, it is result of the cleavage from the transferrin. In anemia of inflammation, you have less of the transferrin because the bone marrow is trying to conserve the iron to fight the infection and inflammation. That's why we don't have much of the uh, transporter around in the circulation. So, in, uh, in iron deficiency anemia, it should be increased, but others uh, like uh, anemia of chronic inflammation, it is uh, decreased. But again, it has also a false value in patients with increased hemolysis because they have increased erythropoiesis and also patients on uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents like RNS. Again, this other test is also not available, RBC portoporphin, RBC zinc. As you know, in iron deficiency anemia, there would be increase in the absorption of zinc and increase uh, incorporation into the uh, protoporphin. So it is, again, increased iron deficiency anemia, whereas in anemia of chronic inflammation, it is uh, decreased. Of course, as, uh, as you know, if you read in any textbook, they would tell you that the bone marrow, uh, uh, bone marrow is the most accurate way of diagnosing iron deficiency anemia, but you know this is an invasive way, though it, is high, it has high specificity, but we don't do it on a regular basis to diagnose iron deficiency anemia. And this is uh, just to show you how uh, it looks uh, in the smear. So if you, uh, if you notice uh, those um, uh, blue dots around the nucleus, this is the deposition of iron inside the mitochondria. So this patient doesn't have iron deficiency anemia, the other patient has iron deficiency anemia because you don't see any of the blue dots in the other patient. So here a graph has tells you how serum ferritin is very helpful in diagnosing iron deficiency anemia. So it is the most specific and most reliable for diagnosing iron deficiency anemia. The others like the uh, MCV, transferrin saturation, protoporphyrin RDW are less specific for iron deficiency anemia. So uh, don't forget the importance of the smear in diagnosing any patients of anemia. So if you have a patient uh, with iron deficiency anemia, especially microcytic hypochromic, the one reaching the severe anemia, would see the microcytic hypochromic. If you notice that, uh, how do we know the, the RBC is, uh, is smaller? We compare to the nucleus of uh, lymphocytes, which is, uh, which is present in the lower picture. So if you notice that the size of the RBCs is uh, less than the nucleus of uh, lymphocytes, and even uh, uh, how dense they are stains, they are less. So they are, they are hypochromic cells. This is what we mean. Microcytic means the size. Hypochromic means the, how much they are densely stained uh, with iron. If you notice, again, we have other changes, that what we call like elliptocytes. The elliptocytes, if you look into the lower one, you see the elongated cells. These are the elliptocytes. And sometimes we see the pencil-shaped cells that, with the taper ends. So, these are almost pathognomonic of uh, morphological changes in iron deficiency anemia. So how do you differentiate a patient coming to you with microcytic hypochromic anemia between iron deficiency and thalassemia trait? First of all, we look into the RBC. The RBC is very helpful in this situation because if you have iron deficiency, the bone marrow is late, it's not producing. It doesn't have the hematinics to produce the red cells. So the, uh, we have the RBC to be low. Whereas in thalassemia trait, they don't have a problems with uh, problem with production of the RBC. They have problem with hemoglobin, hemoglobinization of the red cells. So as to try to uh, compensate for the uh, abnormal hemoglobinization, we have more of the RBC. So usually they have higher RBC count. The hemoglobin, of course, both of them will be low. Or oh, some, sometimes in thalassemia, I mean, if we have alpha thalassemia with one gene deletion, they would have normal hemoglobin. The MCV it would be low in both, but in thalassemia rate, especially if we're talking about beta thalassemia, there's disproportionate decrease to MCV in relation to hemoglobin. For example, if you have a patient coming with hemoglobin of 9, we we'll see MCV like 59. So this is very low in relation to the hemoglobin level. And again, uh, of course, MCH would be proportional to decrease in MCV in both. RDW also it gives us a hint if it is thalassemia trait or iron deficiency. In iron deficiency, as I showed you in the uh, smear before, you can see different population of cells. Some of the elliptocytes, some of them taper, and so this is what gives you the increased width of the distribution of the red cells. 
Whereas in thalassemia traits, we have mostly uniform looking cells, microcytic hyperchrome, but they are uniform uh, looking. So we don't have this increase in the RDW. So your volume in thalassemia trait is very low, huh? Yeah, it is very low in Slower proportion to the, yeah, this is how we screen by the CBC. For in patients with artificial, we have like, an, um, for example, hemoglobin of nine, the MC would be in the 70s. But in thalassemia, it reached with notice with the hemoglobin of nine, they would reach like 60s or lower. Yeah. Because it says both, uh, both low. are low, low. Both are low. But one this is a way, low. yeah, from clinical experience, how we can have a differential. So it's, uh, in thalassemia, the they have high RBC count, normal RBDW, and disproportionate decrease in the MCV in relation to the hemoglobin level. So this is a, a, a smear of patient thalassemia trait. So you can see the, the population is uniform. We don't have discrepancy, though they are microcytic hypochromic. And you can see what we call like target cells. Uh, you can see it most commonly in thalassemia trait. But again, you can see it are a deficiency, but not very common in very, very severe anemia, artificial anemia. OK, so how we can differentiate between anemia of chronic disease and uh, iron deficiency anemia? Maybe this is a dilemma also if you have a patient, for example, with diabetes, with chronic, with renal impairment. So how can you differentiate? The serum for the iron deficiency anemia, of course, will be decreased. Whereas in anemia of chronic inflammation, because we said the, the iron is there in the bone marrow. It is not deficient, but there is no, the, it, the bone marrow is trying to conserve the, ferit, the iron ins inside it. So we have a normal ferritin values or even on the higher side. The serum iron, it would be increased iron deficiency, of course, but in any confirmation, it can be normal or even decreased because of, we have decrease in the circulation iron as well. The total iron capacity is increased in iron deficiency anemia, but it's normal to decrease in anemia of chronic inflammation. And the transfer saturation it is decrease in iron deficiency anemia, but it is even normal in anemia of chronic inflammation. The MCV, it is most of the times, it, or most of it is decrease in anemia, uh, iron deficiency anemia severe state, but anemia of chronic inflammation, most of the time it is normal. Rarely we can see decreased uh, uh, MCV. All right? And of course, the RDW will be high in any, any, uh, of iron deficiency anemia, and anemia of chronic inflammation, it is normal. And the way, as I told you, to uh, differentiate, but we don't have it here in Kuwait, is the serum transfer receptor to the ferritin uh, ratio. It is uh, a log. So if it is uh, increased, uh, it means that we have iron deficiency anemia. If it is decreased, it means anemia of chronic inflammation. And of course, you know the hepcidin. Uh, the hepcidin is an a, 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 a enzyme that stimulates the uh, absorption of iron. So if we have iron deficiency anemia, we don't want the uh, hepcidin. So it's suppressed. But anemia of chronic inflammation should be increased because uh, hepcidin uh, inhibits iron absorption from the gut. OK. So uh, talking about iron deficiency anemia, we should recognize that iron deficiency goes through stages until we reach the anemia level. So stage one, when we have only iron depletion, and the uh, stores in the bone marrow are depleted, but the patient doesn't have any normal CBC, uh, no anemia. Okay, but they might have symptoms, as I told you before. The second stage, where we have a storage level, is so much decreased that we are reaching the degree of anemia. Some of them would have anemia, some of them would have only some decrease in the MCV, MCH. But if we reach the final stage, where the, really there is no iron stores, and the, bomb, the body has consumed all his stores, then we reach a degree of anemia with the frank changes of low MCV, low MCH. So these stages would be reflected in the hemoglobin and hematocrit rate value. So putting all this together, sorry, maybe it is a bit small. So if we put all of these together in, any, uh, in our deficiency uh, without anemia, uh, the serum R will be mildly decreased. The bone marrow has no iron because we don't have iron in the bone marrow. And um, the total iron binding capacity would be normal. Uh, the transfer saturation would be almost up to normal 30. But what differentiates is the ferritin. 
So the ferritin in this patient, in this patient will be low. In our deficiency with mild anemia, we have only mild anemia with them. So uh, anemia would be more than eight gram per deciliter. But again, we have the changes in the iron profile, the low serum iron, the high transfer saturation, and the high transferrin and high TIBC. All right, and 13 would be uh, low. It would be as low as less uh, than 20. In, uh, in severe iron deficiency anemia, we have all the above changes that I mentioned, but we have very low serum for a teen less than 10. <laughs> so again, we already diagnosed a patient with iron deficiency anemia. It's very, very important to know the underlying cause. Uh, what we encounter mostly in, uh, in women, uh, usually uh, anemia due to menorrhagia. It is the number one cause that we encounter. Number two cause because of the increased bariatric surgery in our population, so we have a lot of them coming post-bariatric surgery. I would say the third cause is because of the uh, dietary insufficiency. Okay, they are eating, but they are not eating the proper food. And again, uh, this is mostly in women. Uh, in men uh, and uh, in postmenopausal uh, women, we have to think of like a source of iron loss, for example. And mostly you see in the gut. They have a problem in the gut. So, uh, so if, uh, as I said, uh, one of the uh, causes also um, is um, lo loss from the gut. The other cause we should not overlook, especially if the patient is not responding to iron, is malabsorption. So sometimes it, come, it comes, you up, uh, comes a patient and you roll out from the history like a dietary, there's no source of blood loss, no melina, no mineralgia, and uh, they are eating very well. So we have to roll out like a malabsorption state. Uh, one of the things that we see commonly in our, our hospital, H. pylori infection. So they come even sometimes with subtle symptoms like bloating or epigastric pain. So you have to take into consideration H. pylori as a cause of iron deficiency anemia. The other cause we consider 5% of patients celiac disease. One of the causes, okay? So H. pylori by itself? Yeah, by itself. Because it changes the acidity of the stomach, so it decreases the absorption. Others, of course, you should take like a history if the patient like taking uh, drugs, for example, glucocorticoid, salicylate, but they can cause gastritis and the source of chronic blood loss. Protein pump inhibitors can in, uh, compete with the oral iron, especially if it's taking excessively for a longer time. That's why the patient, one of the causes that are not responding to oral iron is protein pump inhibitors. And of course, there are the other rare genetic uh, causes are refractory iron deficiency anemia. So here to demonstrate uh, how common is the heavy menstrual loss as a cause of uh, iron deficiency anemia, it's not just here in Kuwait, but it is worldwide known as very common cause in uh, women. So defining iron deficiency anemia. Uh, what are the cutoff points, okay? An iron deficiency without anemia would have a normal hemoglobin level, the iron source would be low, but again, the ferritin would be uh, less than 20% uh, or even 15%, and the saturation would be less than 16%. In iron deficiency anemia, we reach an anemic stage. So as I mentioned before, uh, it's the same definition as anemia worldwide. So in men, a hemoglobin level less than 30 is considered anemia. Non-pregnant women less than 12 is considered anemia, and the pregnant ladies less than 11 is considered anemia. So this is a simple approach in, in terms of ordering the investigation. So we already have a patient anemic with low MCV. So we go and order, order the ferritin. Okay, so if it is uh, less than uh, 30, so it means this is our deficiency anemia. Or even uh, we can order also the iron profile by itself. So if we have uh, low serum iron, uh, high TIBC, low transferrin, this is diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia, you can treat the patient according to that. What if the patient has like uh, uh, 13 between 30 to 100 percent? How would they approach the patient? Again, we go to, uh, to the iron profile, okay? 
if the iron profile they have low saturation less than 16 percent especially we can see the situation with any uh, with patient having like uh, anemia of chronic inflammation and in addition iron deficiency anemia so we can do the iron profile if the uh, transfer saturation less than 16 percent even with the high ferritin patient has an element of iron deficiency anemia and patient should be treated with oral iron Others, uh, if these are non-conclusive, then we can we can go in the uh, in the transfer receptor uh, saturation. So if it is increased, it means iron deficiency anemia. If it is decreased, it means the anemia of chronic inflammation. Still, still, if this is not informative, then we can go in the, the protoporphyrin uh, level. If it is increased, it's iron deficiency anemia. Otherwise, we should look for other causes of anemia. And this is evaluation of iron deficiency in terms of uh, bleeding. So in premenopausal women, uh, if we have abnormal uterine bleeding, then we should treat with uh, iron. If we don't have uh, a response, okay, then we should uh, maybe we should check the compliance and see how much patient patient is bleeding and look for other causes of bleeding. All right. So uh, in patients with men and women postmenopausal uh, stage. We should uh, look into uh, sources of GI blood loss, as I told you. So we should order endoscopy and colonoscopy, preferably, especially if the patient have a history of uh, CA colon in the family. So we have like a big suspicion they have a uh, source of GI blood loss. So if we find the source, then we can treat, uh, treat accordingly. But the patient is not responding, then we can repeat the uh, endoscopy. If the patient not responding, we can do the uh, capsule endoscopy. And if still we don't have a response, we can repeat the capsule endoscopy for this patient. Okay, so uh, if we have refractory or unexplained iron deficiency anemia, refractory, of course, after ruling out the patient compliance to medication, the proper dose has been taken by the patient, then we should think of other causes. Most of the times, it is a cause of malabsorption. So if we have celiac disease, we'd send for serology, celiac serology, and do the duodenal biopsy as a, uh, the most confirmative test for celiac disease. Uh, if we have like uh, atrophic gastritis secondary to pernicious anemia, and it's high suspicious sent for anti-intrinsic factor antiparietosal antibodies. The H. pylori, of course, uh, serology would be positive. It is positive, and then we can do the urea breath test for these patients. Do you want to go to treatment or? Yes. Yeah. yes. All right. So uh, oral iron therapy is a good therapy. It is uh, it is in, uh, inexpensive. And it is considered frontline therapy in patients with iron deficiency anemia. But there are some conditions, conditions with the, uh, where they are less tolerated by, by the patient. For example, if uh, they have uh, like gastrointestinal side effects, so the adherence would be less in these patients, so would, they would not take the tablets. If they have like malabsorptive states, they would not respond to the oral tablets that we are giving them. So for these patients, Maybe you can see an effect, or maybe you cannot see, would not see an effect. If you see effects, it would take them longer time to see the effects, up to six to, up to, six to eight weeks until they see maybe some improvement in the hemoglobin level. So what is the indication of oral, mild to moderate anemia, and clinically inactive inflammatory bowel disease? If we have active mitral bowel disease, we, do, we don't recommend oral iron because iron is very irritative to the gut. So instead, we, uh, we recommend to give them parenteral iron preparations. In adults, the recommended dose is 100 to 200 milligram per day. Uh, this is the total dose, all right? In patients with inflammatory bowel disease, it's recommended to give less than 100 milligram per day to decrease irritation to the stomach. In premature neonates, the dose is 2 to 4 milligram per kg, divided every 12 to 24 hours, the maximum 15 milligram daily. In children with mild to moderate uh, anemia, okay, would recommend 
three to six milligram of elemental iron. Okay, it is divided to twelve to twenty four uh, hours daily basis, up to sixty milligram total dose for them. In children uh, with severe anemia, we should uh, go also the same dose, uh, sorry, higher dose, four to six milligram of elemental iron, up to 60 milligram daily. So when are we expected to see a response? If the patient is responding, we expect one gram increase per week. And uh, reticulocyte would we expect to increase after seven days of giving the oral iron. So uh, you shouldn't overlook that the uh, Continuation of oral iron does not stop with the normalization of hemoglobin level. So it was, should be uh, go beyond of normalization up to three to six months. So these are the formulation with, uh, available. What concerns us and most important to us is the elemental iron, which is the ferric iron, the, uh, the consumable iron by the body. So the one that we have that has the highest source available here is the ferrous sulfate. So a tablet has 65 elemental iron. That's why we can give it a, a, a TID dose. But if the patient is not tolerating, we can just start with one tablet and go up to two tablets, then three tablets until the patient ha have more tolerance to the, to the treatment. The other one that we have uh, is first uh, fumarate. It has an it has an elemental of 106 milligrams, so we can give it like a BD dose or OD dose. Uh, these are the available iron preparation that we have here in the hospital. Oh, sorry, oral. The ones that you already mentioned, the ones are available in the hospital. In Kuwait, yeah, in Masafa. So we have the fumarate, and we have the sulfate, and is also we have training? the. Sorry, uh, it's the same, same. This is it. It's a ferrous sulfate, yeah. Okay. And ferrous glucolate, yes. Yeah, okay. So when, uh, what are the signs of patients having uh, expected response? You know, one of the uh, manifesto iron deficiency anemia is pica, where they, uh, they have a tendency to eat like ice or other substances like paper, or some of them with, uh, like, uh, eat sand. So, uh, and also the restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome, it is when the patient feels like a spasm, especially at night, and they have to move the leg around so that they can have relief of the spasm. So if they take uh, an iron, you can see an immediate response in the pica and also the restless uh, leg syndrome. And you can see the changes, uh, the response within days of the oral uh, iron. Uh, the patient uh, will have an improvement of the well-being. So they will tell you, I feel much energetic, uh, my mood is better, my concentration is better, within a few days of taking the oral iron. Uh, the expected response that we monitor for is by the vertex count. So if we have an increased vertex count within 7 to 10 days, that patient, that patient is responding to oral iron, and plus the, the increase in the hemoglobin level, which we expect one gram in a week. So patient with mild anemia would not have like much reticulocytos. Maybe it's not noticeable, not as patient with severe iron deficiency anemia. So as 50% of the patients would uh, complain of the GI side effects like nausea, constipation, some of them would have diarrhea, epigastric distress, uh, and some of them would have symptoms of vomiting or taking oral iron. So uh, there are uh, lots of options for these patients to help them to improve on their compliance. So we can shift them uh, with uh, uh, tablets which have less of uh, elemental iron. For example, if the patient taking like ferrous sulfur, you can shift them to ferrous uh, gluconate until they have better, uh, better tolerance and then we can shift them again to ferrous sulfate. Um, the patient may slowly increase the dose. For example, if a uh, patient is supposed to take like ferrous sulfate three tablets a day, you can start with one tablet, patient tolerating more, you can uh, do it like PD and TID. And of course, in relation to meal, it's the best to take the oral iron in empty stomach. This is what we tell patient. But if it is really 
patients not tolerating, you can, they can take it with meals. So uh, the duration of treatment, uh, of course, we should, uh, 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 we should follow up the patient uh, every month for an uh, hemoglobin response. So if we have a response and we have then uh, normalization of the hemoglobin level, okay, then we should check the ferritin. And of course, we don't stop our normalization, as I said, we go beyond. Beyond means up to three to six months after normalization. And any a patient coming with a, an element of inflammation, like post-bariatric surgery or patient have a chronic disease, we look into a level of more than 113. So less than that is considered as iron deficiency anemia and there's no correction iron deficiency anemia. In patient complaining mostly of hair loss, we would aim to 14 level up to 70. Uh, all right, and so uh, the expected fertile level is 40 to 60, but the patient having hair loss up to 70, and the of chronic inflammation is 100. How often do we have to repeat the fertile level of the... Every three months. Every three months. Parental iron. So before, histor historically, uh, uh, physicians were really reluctant to, take, to give the IV iron because of the uh, preparation like high molecular uh, iron dextran where there is a lot of side effects with these preparations. But with the newer preparations uh, we have in our hospitals, we see less of the toxicity profile, so it's really safe for these patients. So what are the indications of uh, IV iron? First of all, fa failure of oral therapy. For example, uh, if a patient is taking the oral and they have like malabsorptive state, they're not absorbing iron. So this is where it is indicated to give IV iron. Uh, a patient is not tolerating in terms of uh, the symptoms, it's having severe symptoms regarding to side effects. So we recommend to give the uh, IV iron. Some of, uh, some of the time uh, in, some, uh, in some cultures like a Jehovah's Witness where they don't like a blood transfusion, we can give uh, iron as a substitution for uh, a blood transfusion. Of course, patients uh, with chronic kidney disease on uh, erythropoietic stimulating agent, we need to give them IV iron, especially if they are not responding properly to the injection. Other uh, potential causes, Patients with malignancy, they are on uh, uh, erythrocyte stimulating agent, they, have not, they don't have the proper response. Uh, um, of course, um, uh, anemia of chronic disease, as I said. And potential indications, patients with heart fa failure, and, to, um, and, and it is like a substitution of transfusion, the patient really uh, refusing transfusion, and indication for transfusion is one element is iron deficiency anemia. And the dosage for a parental uh, preparation is usually between 1,000 to 2,000 milligram elemental iron. And we should monitor uh, uh, follow up hemoglobin and the iron stores usually after one to two months of giving the IV iron. How often is given? Sorry? It depends on the uh, uh, preparation. So we have uh, in our hospital the iron sucrose and we have the Ferric uh, maltose. The iron sucrose, the, um, uh, in the one time you can give as maximum 200 milligram, and usually it is uh, infused over uh, 40 minutes. In patients with uh, allergies, it is uh, recommended to give like a test dose for the um, IV iron, and then we can give the full dose. The ferric carboxymaltose, the newer one, uh, the iron sucrose, the trade name is uh, Ferrisac. And the ferric carboxymatose, the trade name is Ferringect. So Ferringect is a new preparation. Uh, the advantages, uh, advantage uh, of it is we can give the uh, complete dose in all, only two sessions. And uh, there are less side effects with uh, the ferrous matos and ferrous uh, sucrose. 
So this is the way the how we can calculate the dose in uh, uh, in first arc or first cross. So usually we depend uh, we depend on the hemoglobin level. For example, if we have a patient with a hemoglobin level of ten, and um, uh, they have a, a body weight, for example, of forty uh, uh, kilogram, so we we'll say the patient would need for uh, approximately ten ampoules of iron. So the ampoule, uh, the iron per ampoule is hundred milligram. So uh, uh, in the session we give 200, so in, uh, the patient would need a uh, maximum of 10 sessions. So because in each session you would need 200 milligram, all right? And uh, for inject, we calculate the dose according to the uh, hemoglobin level and the body weight. So for example, if a patient has a hemoglobin level more than 10 and, and uh, body weight more than 70, so the total dose patient would need 1,000 milligram. And we can give this uh, total dose in one session, and that's it. But if it is going to repeat it, usually it is repeated on a weekly basis. So uh, over two weeks only. So this is uh, our Mubarak uh, form for uh, ordering the Furusak. And you can see that we usually take the indications why uh, we are giving the IV preparation. And you should uh, mention the based on hemoglobin and uh, ferritin uh, and how much the total dose should be given to the patient. And the same goes for the pharyngeals. We calculate uh, uh, according to the body weight and hemoglobin level, and we check the indications also. What are the indications? Uh, and of course, you should mention the hemoglobin ferritin the same as the previous form. All right. So points to remember. That ferritin is the most accurate uh, form uh, or test in diagnosing uh, uh, iron deficiency anemia. Especially in the population, we have a lot of patients with thalassemia traits. So sometimes it, would be, it can be uh, difficult to diagnose and mislead, but ferritin would give you a very good diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia in these patients. And uh, population who are uh, recommended to screen are women of childbearing age or pregnant women with a history of multiple uh, uh, pregnant women or those with multiple pregnancies before or even premarital screening or patient going for a bariatric uh, post bariatric surgery so it is advised to screen this fish for iron deficiency anemia oral uh, oral iron uh, therapy is very effective it is very expensive uh, but uh, uh, should uh, educate the patient about the side effects and watch for the tolerability of uh, iron. And we expect an increase of hemoglobin 1 gram per deciliter per week in this patient. And the total uh, duration of therapy should be 3 to 6 months for these patients. And of course, parental iron therapy is another form of iron. And there are specific indications to give uh, uh, the parental iron. And of note, the response uh, with the oral iron parental is the same. But the difference in parental preparation, you're giving them whatever they need in one session. But the oral, you're giving them whatever they need uh, intermittently in a longer period of time.